hath not seen thee oft amid thy store. Sometimes whoever seeks abroad may find thee sitting careless on a granary floor, thy hair soft lifted by the winnowing wind, or on a half-reaped furrow sound asleep, drowsed with the fume of poppies, while thy hook spares the next swathe and all its twined flowers, and sometimes, like a gleaner, thou dost keep steady thy laden head across a brook, or, by a cider press, with patient look, thou watchest the last oozings, hours by hours. Every line of the first stanza is rich with vivid images of fullness and ripeness, with hints of overfulness and overripeness. By contrast, the first two lines of the second stanza are vague and impressionistic. Who hath not seen thee? Whoever seeks abroad? And the images, when they do come, are very different from those of the first stanza. In this second stanza, Keats focuses on autumn as a time not so much of ripeness as of reaping, of harvest. The settings, a granary, a field of half-cropped wheat, a gleaner picking up whatever's left after the main crop has been harvested, and the cider press, represent the process of cropping, of gathering the grains and fruits as they reach maturity. And central to all these scenes is the figure of a personified autumn, sitting on a granary floor, sleeping in a half-reaped furrow, keeping its head steady across a brook. Here one imagines a tree laden with fruit. Uh, or watching apples being squeezed in a cider press. This personification of autumn is perhaps the most striking feature of this stanza. In the granary, autumn is represented both as a human figure sitting on the floor, hair blowing in the wind, and as a sheaf of wheat being winnowed, that is, the grain being separated from the chaff. Autumn sleeping in the wheat field represents a pause in the process of cutting and reaping, but we are reminded of its hook and the inevitability of the harvest. The poorer inhabitants of the countryside would become gleaners in the autumn, picking up grain and fruit and so on that got left behind after the farmers had gathered their crops, and autumn is seen here both as a tree laden with fruit and as a gleaner, watching for the chance to gather the leftover crops. And finally, Autumn watches on as the juice oozes out of apples in a cider press. This personified Autumn, with its hook, invokes the image of death with a scythe. But just as the first stanza merely hints that after ripeness and fruition come rottenness and decay without actually saying so, so in the second stanza, the association between autumn and death is implied, but not stated directly. The alliterated H, S and W sounds in the first four lines of the stanza seem to capture the quality of the wind, emphasised by the half-rhyme with FIND. There's a kind of dry, warm feeling about these lines. We know the wind is not rough or violent from the fact that autumn's hair is soft-lifted by it as it goes about its work of winnowing, separating the chaff from the grain. So the comfortable feeling of the first stanza is continued into the second stanza, but in a different way, focusing on the harvesting, particularly the harvesting of grain, rather than on the fruition and ripeness of autumn. Once again, though, the poet hints at something less comfortable. Autumn may pause for a while, but in the end its hook will cut down every swathe of corn. Just as ripeness implies rottenness, so harvest implies death. And while the alliterated spares the next swathe depicts autumn in abeyance, it's a temporary reprieve, not an absolution. In the end, everything will be cut down. But Keats doesn't dwell on this. On the contrary, having hinted at it in the sixth and seventh lines of the stanza, he backs away from such thoughts, emphasising instead the patience of autumn as it oversees the harvesting and storage of crops, with the word oozings giving just a hint of that sense of clammy ripeness that characterised the first stanza. Mm -hmm. 